Book Six, Chapter Six, Part Two of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is a recording by Wang Anqi. The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two, by Henry Charles Lee. Book Six, Practice, Chapter Six, Part Two, Confession. Perhaps the most striking illustration of the effectiveness of the rule requiring denunciation of others is furnished by a Morisco of Valencia named Francisco Safar y Ribera. He had been a Christian only in outward show, when a miraculous change of heart sent him on a pilgrimage to Montserrat, where he confessed his heresy to a priest. The good padre, unable to absolve him, referred him to the Barcelona tribunal, where, as a condition president, he was required to denounce all whom he knew to be Moors. The inquisitors, finding these to be Valencians, dispatched him to Valencia, where he gave the names of no less than four thousand. He had been a wandering tailor, and his acquaintance was extensive. Few of those who fell into the hands of the Inquisition had the heroic courage of Manuel Diaz, a victim in the great Mexican Alto de Fe of December eighth, fifteen ninety six. Although ten of his fellow sufferers had testified against him, he steadily denied his guilt and was proof against both the threats and the blandishments of the inquisitors. There was nothing to do but to burn him as a negativo in penitente, except that he might be used to inculpate others. And for this he was sentenced to torture in caput alienum. When this sentence was read to him, he simply said that he was ready for them to do with him as they pleased. He was in his thirty-eighth year and a vigorous man, for he endured a torture of unusual severity. And although he shrieked and begged to be put to death and called upon his tormentors to have mercy on his five children, he denied all knowledge of the law of Moses and went to the stake without bearing witness against his fellows. This was held to aggravate his guilt, and in his sins he was stigmatized as a falter and protector of Judaizing heretics. If the inquisitorial records occasionally ennoble human nature with such examples of self-sacrifice, they more frequently exhibit it in its most despicable aspect. Through the eagerness with which unfortunates, enfeebled and despairing in their protracted incarceration, seek to gain the favor of pitiless judges, or to render their confessions complete, by hastening to betray the confidences of their cell companions, who incautiously relieve their hearts in careless talk with comrades in misery. The instances are innumerable in which the recipient of such avowals at once asks an audience and proves the sincerity of his own conversion by detailing what he had heard. There is a certain grim satisfaction, however, in noting that these revelations, however damaging to the victim, seem never to benefit the informer, for I have nowhere observed that they are accepted as attenuating circumstances to diminish his own punishment. The time at which a confession was made was an important factor in determining the grade of punishment. At first these distinctions were crudely drawn, and there was hesitation in accepting confession as an infallible sign of repentance and conversion. The instructions of 1484 merely say that, if it is made early and before publication of evidence, the regular penalty can be commuted to those who manifest contrition. If after publication and before definite sentence, the culprit is entitled to reconciliation or perpetual prison, but the inquisitors must determine whether he is sincerely converted, for if they have no hope of this, they should relax him as an impenitent heretic. It seems to have been thought that, under these rules, too many fictitious converts escape for, in 1498, the tribunals were warned to be cautious about admitting to reconciliation those who confessed after arrest in view of the length of time since the establishment of the Inquisition. Thus, after arrest, confession and profession of conversion by no means saved the victim from the stake, but it depended upon the Inquisitor's belief in his sincerity. This excessive severity was moderated in time, 
and there came to be established a kind of sliding scale which God's sincerity by the period in the trial at which confession was made. An elementary form of this is displayed in a report of an alto de fe at Saragossa, June 5, 1585, where many moriscos suffered. There is a group of ten of whom it is said that, as they confessed at the beginning of their trials, they were imprisoned for two, three, or four years according to the gravity of their offenses. Then there are others sent to the galleys for terms of from three to eight years, because their confessions were tardy or delayed to the end of their trials. As women were exempt from galley service, this classification was impossible for them, but their terms of prison were regulated in the same way, and two of them had their San Benitos removed at the close of the proceedings, because they had come forward and confessed before arrest, though after they had been testified against. This system was gradually perfected and, as presented by a writer of the middle of the 17th century, it appears that, if confession was made before the fiscal presented his formal accusation, the prison and San Benito were inflicted for a very short time. If after accusation, they were for one or two years. If not till after publication of evidence, for the three years styled perpetual. If after torture, irremissible prison, and if able-bodied, the first three or five years to be spent in the galleys. This might be modified according to the manifestation of repentance and whether the culprit was a good confessor, both as to himself and others, and, in the case of slaves, to avoid wronging the owner, scourging was substituted for prison and galleys. Subsequently, this resource of scourging was freely employed for those who were not slaves, and that the frequent altos of 1721 and the following years the cases are numerous in which men and women are sentenced to two hundred lashes and irremissible prison and san benito as a special punishment for tardy confession confession under torture was originally not regarded as voluntary and did not relieve from relaxation showing that its use on a culprit who denied was either merely to gratify curiosity or to obtain information as to accomplices subsequent casuists however, argued that the ratification of the confession, which was necessary after twenty-four hours, rendered it voluntary, and the more usual practice was to admit such cases to reconciliation. The instructions of 1561 accept this, but warn inquisitors that they must observe much caution as to such cases and consider the quality of the heresies and whether the offender had simply been taught or had taught others still this distinction was disregarded and simancas tells us that the universal practice was to receive to reconciliation those who confessed under torture it can readily be conceived that those who confessed under the all-inspiring formalities of the trial with the pressure of prolonged imprisonment the threat of torture and the fear of the stake and whose submissions came gradually with greater or less fullness as they vacillated between opposing influences were not infrequently inconsistent and variable in their utterances this was naturally provoking to the inquisitor and the vario who thus wavered cast doubt upon the sincerity of his repentance he was submitted to reconciliation indeed but he paid the penalty of his vacillation in extra punishment Thus, in the Morcia Alto de Fe of October 18, 1722, Francisco Enriquez de Medina y Melo, besides the regular penance, was sentenced to a hundred lashes por vario en sus confesiones. Even more provoking was the revocante, who withdrew or revoked a confession, an occurrence by no means rare, as might be expected from the methods employed to obtain it. The writers all treat this as impenitence, requiring relaxation in cases of formal heresy. In practice, it was so regarded as a general rule, but we find occasional exceptional cases in which, however, care was usually taken to inflict heavier punishment than if the confession had been adhered to. In the Toledo Alto of 1603, a morisco, Andres Menos, who had revoked his confession and consequently had been sentenced to relaxation, was saved by the Suprema, which ordered torture and, on his overcoming it, gave him five years of galleys and a heavy fine. Another case occurred in Granada in 1593, 
where Husuarte Lopez, a Portuguese, confessed to Judaism and then, on finding that there was little evidence against him, revoked his confession and was condemned to five years of galleys, followed by irremissible prison in San Benito. This apparent inconsistency arose from the infinite perplexities caused to the conscientious inquisitor by the arbitrary methods employed to induce or to extort confession. We obtain a glimpse into this from the remarks of an old inquisitor, about 1640, who, after laying down the rule of relaxation, proceeds to warn the judge that he should proceed with caution and consider the circumstances under which the confession had been made. I have known, he adds, the mere fear excited by the fiscal's formal demand for torture at the end of the accusation bring a confession which necessitated torture to ascertain its truth. In 1628, I had a case in Saragossa, where a French man voluntarily confessed that he had been a Lutheran and that, as such, he had been reconciled in Toledo. On being arrested, he stated that his father had taught him Lutheranism and that he was reconciled in Toledo. After several audiences, he revoked this, and asserted that what he had confessed in Toledo was false, that there were no heretics where he came from, and that his father had not taught him. And then, in his defense, he proved this, and that both he and his father were Catholics. I voted for relaxation, but the Suprema ordered torture. He overcame the torture, and was finally sentenced to abjure de vehementi, to undergo public vergüenza and to perpetual banishment from Spain. If the revocation, the writer concludes, is of things of which there is semi plena proof, as of one witness, and it appears that it is made to protect accomplices and friends, then in rigor he is to be relaxed. But in these times relaxation is rare if he confesses enough to justify a reconciliation that the terrors of the situation frequently reduced the prisoner to a mental condition that was practically irresponsible is illustrated in a trivial case concerning the popular assertion that simple fornication was no sin in 1579 at toledo diego redondo of prado on trial for this denied at first then when the accusation was read with its customary demand for torture he confessed then when the testimony of five witnesses was read in the publication, he revoked his confession, saying that it was made through fear. He did not know whether he had made it or not, but if he did so, he was out of his senses. He remembered that he had said he knew not what, and had retracted it, and he did not remember, and this was what he said. This crazed incoherence puzzled the tribunal. It referred the case to the Suprema, which charitably sentenced him to hear high mass at Prado while his sentence was publicly read, and then to spend two years in exile. There was another form of revocation which greatly scandalized the Inquisition in consequence of the reflection cast upon its methods. This was the assertion by penitents, subsequent to trial, that they were innocent and had only confessed through fear of the consequences of denial. It was sufficiently frequent to be included in the Edicts of Faith, among the offenses to be denounced by all cognizant of it. In the earliest instructions of 1484, it is ordered that such offenders are to be held as impenitent and as fictitious converts and are to be prosecuted as such, which of course meant relaxation. This severity was moderated in time, but the offense was still punished in a manner to discourage it. In 1578, Niccolò Solari, who had been reconciled by the Tribunal of Sardinia, had the imprudence to present to the Suprema a petition revoking his confession. He was tried for this in Toledo, and escaped with two years' exile from Sardinia and the royal court. A wholesale case of this kind, in Valencia, in 1540, aroused much excitement. A large number of prominent conversos had been punished, some with relaxation, on the charge of holding conventicles in which Jewish fasts were observed, and a crucifix was scourged. Subsequently, they asserted that their confessions had been extorted by fear. Popular feeling was excited, and there was danger that the Inquisition would be seriously discredited, for ecclesiastics of high repute had recommended them to revoke their confessions, and had joined in a letter on the subject to Inquisitor-General Tavera. 
the honor of the inquisition was to be preserved at all hazards dr Aceve was sent as a special commissioner to investigate and his report increased the disquietude to reinforce the valencia tribunal in may fifteen forty one Tavera urged Loases of Barcelona to hasten thither and take charge of the matter, promising him support for his advancement. Then, in October, two members of the Suprema were sent there to assist, and two additional inquisitors were put to work. The crisis was evidently alarming, and there was ample for them all to do. Prosecutions were instituted against all who had revoked their confessions. They were kept segregated to prevent collusion, and, as the secret prison of the tribunal was inadequate, the inquisitors and officials were turned out of their quarters, and seven adjoining houses were hired and converted into jails. What was the number involved does not appear, but a letter of November 26, 1543, mentions that 22 cases had been voted on. 20 more were in progress, on which they were working night and day and on feast days. In the remainder, it was hoped to conclude so that all might be included in a single auto. The prisoners had no chance. A letter of the Suprema suggests that the publication of evidence be omitted, because many of the witnesses had retracted their evidence, and a knowledge of this would encourage the accused in their defense. The consultas de fe were to be packed, taking care to admit none who were favorable to them, and, under such conditions, the result was inevitable. Full details are lacking. We only know that altos de fe were held in which the culprits appeared for the second time. The sentences appear not to have been severe, but the honor of the Inquisition was vindicated. The negativo, who persistently denied his guilt, in the face of competent testimony, was universally held to be a pertinacious and penitent heretic, from whom there was no alternative save burning alive, although, as Samanca says, he might protest a thousand times that he was a Catholic and wished to live and die in the faith. This was the inevitable logic of the situation, for otherwise the guilty could escape, at the mere cost of asserting innocence, and the effort to purify the land might as well be abandoned. There were, indeed, comparatively few who did not at first assert their orthodoxy, nor many who did not ultimately yield to the effective methods to obtain confession. Those who resisted to the end and went to the stake, asserting their Catholicism, were unquestionably good Christians who preferred the most frightful of deaths rather than admit that they had been heretics and confess and abjure heresies that they had never entertained, for if they were really guilty there was nothing more to be gained by denial than by the defiant avowal of their beliefs. Cases of this kind were by no means rare. There were five in Toledo between 1575 and 1606. There were three in a single auto in Granada in 1593. There was one in the Great Madrid Alto of 1680, and two in those of Majorca in 1691. The inquisitors themselves admitted the danger of burning the good Catholic, whose conscience would not permit him of accusing himself of heresy, and Peña considers at some length the question whether, under the pressure of approaching death by fire, it is illicit to make a false confession. He concludes that this is in no sense permissible, and he comforts the victim by assuring him that his constancy will win him the palm of martyrdom. The Church will never know how many martyrs of this kind the Inquisition furnished to its role of uncanonized saints. It required indeed persistent constancy for the true believer to persevere to the end in denial, for the Inquisition held open the door to repentance to the latest moment possible. If, at the alto de fe, a negativo asked for an audience, it was at once granted. He was removed from the staging. He had an opportunity to confess and profess conversion. His case was gone over, and such penance was imposed as was demanded by the gravity of the charges and the delay in the confession. Such cases were by no means rare, and bear witness to the awful strain on the weakness of average human nature. When all other means failed to obtain a satisfactory confession, including the denunciation of the accomplices, there was always in reserve the potent persuasive of torture. End of Book 6 Chapter 6 Part 2 
This was a recording by Wang Anxi.